Happy Labor Day Sunday, Lake Forest. I'm Mike Moses, lead pastor here. It's good to see you today. What do you think of when you think of Jesus? What image comes into your mind when you think of Jesus? There are a lot of different images that we have of Jesus when, when, when we hear his name. Uh, maybe today you think of, uh, of the actor in the, the show The Chosen. Do we have any chosen fans in here this morning? Yep, lots of chosen fans. Um, uh, or how about some people, uh, depending on what age you are, might think about the 1950s Anglo Jesus that hung in every church, Protestant church basement in America and in my grandmother's house. Um, Or how about, maybe is your image the encouraging sacred heart, thumbs up Jesus, um, (laughs) who was Protestant with his thumbs up, but he still got the sacred heart uh, for Roman Catholics. Um, And if you grew up about, if you're my age or older and you grew up in Sunday school, maybe when you hear Jesus, you imagine felt bored Jesus. Uh, like this one, where John the Baptist is either baptizing or karate chopping Jesus in the Jordan River. Felt bored Jesus takes a little explanation and interpretation. My new favorite personal, uh, fa- personal favorite is Lego brick Jesus, because of course, why not? And this is the miracle of Jesus walking on water while Peter is drowning. Um, disciples and boats sold separately. Uh, <laughs> Theologians, uh, on a much more serious turn, describe um, three images of Jesus that we see in the Gospels that define who he is for you and for me. And, and, and these are called the, the three offices or roles that Jesus filled for us. And this is prophet, priest, and king. And it's interesting, in the Old Testament, when God is beginning to reveal his true self and true nature to humanity through the Israelites, no one person possessed more than one of these offices. They all existed, but they were beginning to reveal something. The king is revealing God's leadership. The prophet is speaking God's word that he has a will and an opinion for how we are and how we live in this world. And that the priest is one who connects, who grabs the hand of God and the hand of every man, woman, and child and holds them together. Uh, That's the sacred heart of Jesus there. And in the Old Testament, no one fulfills all three of these roles, but Jesus does fulfill and embody all three of these offices or images. Um, it, it's like you could say here in football season, he was a triple threat, uh, prophet, priest, and king. And we often were familiar with talking about Jesus as our high priest, and we did that all summer in the book of Hebrews, like chapter after chapter. And we're familiar to sing in our worship songs of Jesus, you know, as king, all hail King Jesus. That's what we're, we sing that pretty often here. Um, but what does it mean that Jesus was a prophet? And this series, Flipping Tables, is a way for three weeks for us to look at just three ways, there are multiple, that Jesus is a prophet to us on behalf of God. And one of the most striking glimpses of Jesus as prophet comes at a critical turning point in Matthew's gospel. Jesus has just ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey. It's called Palm Sunday. And him riding on that donkey instead of a war horse is showing what kind of a king he would be, a humble, peaceful king. And then he goes straight to the temple where Jesus is about to replace the whole priesthood with his atonement as resurrection at the end of this week. And let me read to you how he now engages as prophet in Matthew 21. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. And asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus. And look what they call him, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers. He kicked over the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said, and now he's quoting an Old Testament prophet here. My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. You ever read this passage and be like, what in the name of Jesus is Jesus doing here? Like, what's going on? What happened to gentle, meek, clear all hair Jesus? You're like, what happened to him who just rode into Jerusalem on a peaceful donkey instead of a war horse? 
In one of the, the other gospel accounts, the gospel of John, we're told Jesus actually handmade a whip for this occasion. He was pre- this was premeditated. Is Jesus losing it? Is he just angry and he's finally like, I've had it with you people, right? And therefore, the answer for me in my life, when I ask, what would Jesus do? That means I can go all Jersey Shore on anybody, anytime and blame it on Jesus. Is that what this means? No, (laughs) Jesus is doing nothing like that. What is he doing? He's embodying and inhabiting the ancient practices of the Hebrew prophet. And I think the category for us that we would understand is it's prophetic performance art. He's saying something and embodying it with his actions at the same time so it will stick. The greater you know the Old Testament, the more you'll be able to recall. An Old Testament prophet named Hosea married someone so that in his actions he would be embodying what God was saying through his words. Jeremiah dug a pit and was in it while teaching the words of God that were mournful about God's people. And Jesus is performing as he is prophesying here. The role of a prophet we often misunderstand in the Bible. It's not so much to predict things in the future, once in a great while it is, but but 95% of the role of a prophet in the Bible is to speak God's heart to the present, to God's people, to point out injustice and oppression and when God's people are acquiescing to that, to give a corrective to God's people when we are conforming to the world's ways instead of God's ways. That's a prophetic word. Like, this is not how God's people are supposed to live, y'all. That's prophetic. And that's what's happening here physically when Jesus flips the tables in the temple. Uh, and, and Jesus' teaching is prophetic all the way through the Gospels. He's seeking to be a change agent to the world. He was a change agent. He was successful in that ambition, and he would like to be a change agent in my life and yours. In fact, you'll be familiar with this, one of the forms of Jesus' teaching. He had several different forms. One was parables. Another one was this. You'll recognize it. You have heard it said that, and then he says what the normal script is of normal people about this part of life. And then he says what? But I say to you, and then he flips it. He flips the script or he flips the table of conventionality. That's his prophetic ministry of how to align with God's character, not conventionality, which is the best way to live and the way to reflect God's heart to those around me. And so here on this day, Jesus is saying the whole temple system is upside down. We need to flip it. Because where the money changers are, the court that is named here was the one place in the temple where foreigners, seekers, inquirers, skeptics could go in the temple. Only Hebrew believers could go inside. But this was the place where people who didn't have faith yet but but had heard about this one true God of love, this is where they could come. But they were being edged out. There's no room for those who don't yet believe because of the money changers. And Jesus says, that ain't right. This is supposed to be a house of prayer for all people, meaning even the Gentiles. He's saying, Israel, you're not getting the part about being a light to the nations right. I'm going to flip some tables because we need to make room up in here for one more hurting person who's given up on temple or whatever their own religion is, but not on God. And that's what he's doing when he's flipping tables here to call us back to God's way of seeing things, in that case, in the temple. And that's what this series is about, uh, called Flipping Tables, and that's why I have these precarious tables above me. So if I stand here, will you pay more attention? You're like, gee, I wonder if Dustin Harward put that up there securely or not. Is he a true professional? We will find out during these three months, uh, over the next, uh, these three weeks. Over these next three weeks, we're going to look at three key areas in our lives where Jesus invites us to flip the tables and flip the script and challenge our common thinking to a better way, to God's way. Next Sunday, I'll be here to teach a message titled, Jesus and Parties. We're going to talk about the kinds of parties Jesus went to and who he partied with, and we're going to talk about the political parties of those he partied with and what he had to say about that. That'll be next week, Jesus and Partying. Um, I've never taught a sermon title that before. I kind of like that. Um, that's next week. But today, there's no better place to st- start th- th- where our culture needs flip, table flipping and my life than with the topic of money. 
We've heard it before. Jesus talked about money more than any other subject, and that's true, but why? Because Jesus cares about your heart. Jesus cares about your heart. Jesus loves you, who you are, in your heart of hearts. He loves you more than you love yourself. He loves the things you love about you. He loves the things about you that you're insecure about. He loves you even though your life story has some hardships and some rebellion in it. Jesus loves you, and he loves your heart. And he wants you to follow him with all your heart and live out of the power of his for you, given to you by his resurrection, which we'll celebrate at the table. And Jesus said this, where your treasure is, Matthew 6, 21, that's where your heart will be also. Jesus cares about your heart, so he dares to invite you to flip the script and flip the table regarding money in your life because it's connected to our heart. And today I'm going to talk about four ways Jesus wants to flip the table on money, four ways to challenge our culture's thinking about money, call us to a better way. So if that's four things on money, I guess that's money, 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 money. That's actually four. And the first one is this, the script that Jesus wants to flip is whose money is it in the first place? Namely, that we are not the owners of our money, but what the Bible calls stewards. Uh, One of the first words we learn as a child is mine. That's the first word. That toy is mine. That chair is mine. That Rice Krispie Treat is mine. And the only more important word in a child's vocabulary as as a youngster is the word dad. Um, (laughs) According to some study that I just made up. Uh, But from a very young age, even though we didn't earn it, make it, or buy it, we start to think of ourselves as the owners of the goldfish in our grubby little dirty toddler hand. Mine. And this has some strong repercussions if we continue with this script about money throughout our whole life as an owner. In Psalm 24, verse 1, the psalmist writes, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So who is the owner? We get confused about that. And today I'm going to talk about beliefs and they're going to move toward behavior. This is in the belief realm. Who's the owner? Uh, A little bit ago, I was reading in um, a a well-known theological journal called The Reader's Digest, Um, and uh, there was this traveler in between flights at an airport who went to a lounge and bought a small package of cookies. She sat down and began reading a magazine, and gradually she became aware of a rustling noise from behind her magazine. She was flabbergasted to see a well-dressed man helping himself to her cookies. Not wanting to make a scene about it, she leaned over and just took a cookie out of the pack that he had opened. She took one herself. A minute or two passed. She put her magazine back up. She heard some more rustling. He was helping himself to another one of her cookies. So she reached out and grabbed another one more quickly, and this went on until they were down to the last cookie, which the man gently broke in two, smiled, pushed half of the cookie across the table to her, ate the other half, and left to catch his flight. She was still fuming about this sometime later when her flight was announced. She opened her handbag to get her cell phone out, and to her shock and embarrassment, there she found her pack of unopened cookies (laughs) in her purse. (laughs) Not only had she not been eating her cookies, She had been eating his cookies. How I deal with the cookies depends a lot on whose cookies I think they are. And Jesus wants to flip the table on whose cookies are they in my life and yours. Because our human nature is really funny on this one. Once we possess something and hold it in our hands, we assume we own it. And this is true of our stuff, our time, our gifts, and yes, our money we're speaking of specifically. But we forget the very ability to earn the opportunities we've been given. All of the family we were born into, all of them come from God. The author of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament puts it this way, Deuteronomy 8, 17. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. 
But remember, the Lord your God, it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Notice, he's not condemning wealth. It's a God gives it, in fact, God gave us the ability to produce it, so it's good. And he confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors, as it is today. The collective witness of God's word, the Bible, is that we are not the owners of our money. We are the managers of it. That's what the word steward means in the Bible, a, a manager of someone else's resources. We're not owners, but stewards. Our culture thin, tends to think what we do with our money is solely up to us because we're the ones who earned it. But the truth is our earning power has much more to do with the family we were born into, educational opportunities we were afforded, market timing way beyond our control, maybe a mentor who just picked us by grace, uh, or we were given an inordinate amount of willpower. Jesus tells the story that will be familiar. I won't read it, but he tells a story of three stewards. Do you remember this to illustrate this? He, three stewards, one is given, uh, each are given one, another's given two, another's given five talents, and talent meant money. He might as well have said cash. Um, and, and the question is, how will they manage what they've been entrusted with? And the, his point, Jesus, when he tells that story, he means for every one of us to read. We're not Jesus in the story. Okay, let's go ahead and be clear about that. <laughs> um, we are the steward, and he's applying the word steward to every one of us literally regarding money. And the question is, you might have been given one talent. You might have been given two big fistfuls of cash. You might have been given five. The question Jesus asks is, how will we manage it in a way that honors the owner? We are stewards, not owners. Uh, and, and will we manage it in a way that reflects the heart of the owner? The second flipping of table Jesus invites us to make is, is, is in the belief moving toward action, and, and, uh, and this is attitude. It's a constant pursuit of more to the contentment of enough, because the myth of more is all around us. The myth of somehow that our satisfaction, our happiness, or the good life will be found in having more, in this case today, I'm talking about money, and that that money will represent more of other things. For some of us, it's pleasure. For some of us, it's security. For some of us, it's opportunity. For some of us, it's freedom. It represents something different, but that the more money and the more, more, more of it is a constant pursuit as opposed to being content with enough with the number of talents God has allowed me to have. Um, one group of researchers at the University of Chicago found most of us feel this way. If we could just make 10% more, then we would finally have enough. That, that is a mantra of Americans. But what surprised the researchers most was that this was true even of the uber wealthy. People making 10 million more a year said 10% more might be enough. And what that means is that more is never enough. And we all kind of know that, but can we believe it and activate it in our life as a steward, not an owner? Dr. Steve Taylor calls this, you know, more, 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 constant pursuit of more. Um, he calls this phenomenon of psychological discord. Many of us are living in what he describes as a constant state of alertness and anxiety because of, I've got to have more. I'm not content with where it is today or I'm afraid of losing what I have. Always hustling, always striving, because on some basic level, we're convinced that if we had a little bit more, we would finally be secure. And this is, uh, yeah. But listen to how Jesus addresses this question in his well-known Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, verse 25. Therefore I tell you, Jesus says, don't worry about your life. He's speaking specifically about this psychological discord. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you'll wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap, stow away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? But seek first his ki Here's the antidote. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Here's the flip of the table, is if instead of the more, 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 more with money, which the culture gets on me about, if I can seek first more, more, more of God, it'll put 
the amount of money in perspective and lead to contentment if I seek first God's kingdom and righteousness. That's quite a flip. And notice Jesus says, yes, striving and seeking is good. Seeking first the things of God and His righteousness. Then all the other needs and strivings will be taken care of. Does this mean don't work hard? Don't ask for the promotion. Don't go into business for yourself in order to take a leap in the potential of building generational wealth. Or students, does this mean don't study for your test in school tomorrow? Since that's your job. Mom, I'm just trying to put God's kingdom and his righteousness first. Um, uh, no, nail that stuff. That, that's addressed throughout the Bible, that whatever God's put our hands in front of us to do, we're to do it with excellence, as though we're working for him, not a human person. Nail that stuff, right? But here he's asking, but what's the point of your doing that stuff and the money, the lifeblood that it earns? And he's saying, take up my script for your life. The point is not more stuff. The point is seeking first God's kingdom. Then I can live with contentment instead of psychological discord at whatever level my finances have settled out at in this certain period of my life, which will be different through different phases of life. And so therefore, if I'm always wanting more and not having it, I'll be discontent and exhausted. And what if in doing this Jesus way, I'm a steward, not an owner, and instead of more, more, more money, I'm content with the talents that I have at the moment while working hard, working my tail off, but it's not about the pursuit of more, it's about the pursuit of God This brings us to our third flip, which begins to get into, how do I behaviorize this? How do do I activate this from intention to behavior? And this is from, he flips the table from a life of receiving to a life of giving. (coughs) Our culture says the good life is when you get, 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 rather than when we give, 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 give. Or as my friend Michael Flake likes to put it, uh, the, the culture's uh, uh, script is just let it flow into me, and that's becoming a swamp. <laughs> I'm just a recipient. Instead, God's script is let it flow into me and through me as a genera- generous person like a fresh, clean, flowing river. We move from receiving to giving when it comes specifically to money. I love how the Apostle Paul describes this principle at the end of his first missionary journey. Uh, Look at this, Acts 20, verse 35. In everything I did, I showed you that, that by this kind of hard work, there's God's word saying hard work is good for people, that we must, and now he's speaking a kingdom principle instead of the more monster. We must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's Paul quoting Jesus. Now, there's certainly a psychological aspect to this. Study after study has shown that we take more joy from giving a meaningful gift to another than we do from receiving the exact same gift from that other person. There are literal studies on that, which means that's how the God who designed us made us to function best, to be a net giver not receiver, that it ups our joy factor. Uh, And and Paul's talking about something even deeper here, though, than just giving a gift and getting a little bit of joy from it. He's talking about the kind of life and the character of a human being by repeated behaviors over a long period of time, day by day, a life of generosity that Jesus calls his followers to live. Look at a few of the other things Jesus said about giving. Luke 6 He says, give to everyone who asks. It's very challenging to me when I'm accosted on the street. We went out to the Lion King uh, uh, Thursday night. It's challenging to me. What does it mean for me to play this out? Um, Luke 14, give to those who can't repay. Matthew 10, freely give what we freely received. And John 15, Jesus is pointing to his generosity that will ultimately empower ours. Greater love has no one than this, than they lay down their life for their friend. Um, My wife Angie, by the way, has found a way to live out that first one, give to everyone who asks. I've gone back and forth. I 
for a while, I'd just always keep dollars in my pocket so I could give something as my own literal obedience to that principle of Jesus. But Tony uh, Marciano, the longtime executive director, ministry partner here of Charlotte Rescue Mission, said, Mike, that's just enabling. Don't do that. But my wife, Angie, learned from a friend a better way to live out this life of generosity. She plans it, and then she does it. She keeps plastic baggies in her car with a bottle of water, with some hand wipes or whatever it is, some toiletries, uh, with a snack, something robust, sometimes an apple or sometimes granola bar, and, uh, and a bus ticket sometimes or sometimes information about social services. And I really admire that in her of attempting to be daily ready to obey Jesus with the character, not the belief, but the character, the life character of a generous person. Generosity is at the heart of what it means to be a part of God's people. Our culture says giving is a nice thing to do. Jesus says giving is an essential thing to do, to have character. Otherwise, it does not characterize us, and we do not have this as part of our character. Um, This is true as it has to do with money and representing our livelihood. But what does this look like specifically? Well, here at Lake Forest, the way we summarize the Bible's teaching and wisdom on money is something called the uh, uh, 1080 plan. And we've summarized this many times before, but I'll put it on screen. The scriptural wisdom on money is to, let's put this on screen, the 101080, is give 10%, uh, which is the tithe, save 10%, which is wisdom, and live on 80%, which is contentment. Um, we believe the Scriptures call, first of all, here, we're talking about money today, uh, that we're called to give 10%, the first 10%, the first fruits, the Bible says, throughout, of all we earn as a kind of spiritual practice or discipline of putting God and God's mission in this world first in our life. That's simply what tithe means. And it, and it means 10%. It doesn't mean whatever I, we happen to give is in our pocket. Why 10%? I don't know. Uh, but I've thought about this a lot. Like, experientially in my life, first of all, it's the amount that's enough for me to feel it and notice it. I know that for a fact. Also, why 10%? Well, I know it's enough for me to know exactly the possibilities of more than I'm saying no to. I know exactly any given month. I will tell you, if you ask me on the street, what car or second home or whatever thing did you think of this month, Mike, that if it weren't for tithing, you would have. I can tell you that. I don't know if that's good or bad. I'm not recommending that. But because we tithe, I just, so I don't know if that's true for you, but that's one reason why it's 10%, because it's that significant. And it's like the amount that shows my will and my behavior is aligned with my belief. Uh, That I'm a steward and not an owner, and I want to be generous according to the way Jesus says it. And if I'm not tithing, then either I don't believe I'm a steward and I believe I'm an owner, or I'm not willing to align my life and and be content with a standard of living that would fit my beliefs, which is cognitive or spiritual dissonance. 10, 10, 80. And then 10% is wisdom to be ready for an emergency in the future, and 80% is to be content with the lifestyle that that affords. It's a biblical life with money. Now, I'm aware of issues, at least two issues, whenever I teach this, and so I can't just like teach it and move on. Um, First, some of you are worried, is Mike teaching this because our church is in trouble? Is this like a, like a, is that why this is? And the answer is no. Lake Forest Honorsville Church is doing great financially. Year to date, we're something like 3% under budget on spending, and we're about 2% ahead of budget on our giving. So good job, staff. (laughs) Um, thanks to the budgeting wisdom of our elders and the hundreds of families and individuals who give regularly as, as the character of generosity to the mission of Lake Forest. Thanks to that, we're fine. So I just say, well done. I don't say thank you because it's not about me. Angie and I are doing this too. I just say, well done to those of you who are investing in the kingdom of God, work in this world through the mission in your church. It's a joy to partner with you in, in this great work. Um, So if you're a follower of Jesus here this morning and you're not tithing, then I suggest you go home, set up online giving for 1% to 3% more per month than you're giving today. 
The Apostle Paul teaches proportional and regular giving um, according to our income. Uh, uh, to your church and perhaps to your favorite mission, one to three percent more today. Go home and do this today uh, is my suggestion. And then in the new year, you'll see God has blessed you and you have more peace in your finances and, and step that back up toward the tithe again. Um, that brings me to a second issue, and that might be if you're not a Christian today or, or, or you're, uh, yeah, um, and that's the concern that the church only wants your money. So one of, one, a ministry partner told me two months ago, yeah, a friend of mine came to church with me recently, loved all of it, loved the music, loved the sermon, you seem like a guy he wouldn't mind having a beer with, so good job, Pastor Mike. Um, uh, that's one of my literal goals, by the way. Uh, and uh, not to have it, but anyway. Um, <laughs> blah, 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 squirrel. Uh, but when, when y'all said the thing about the jeans pockets and if you want to give now, uh, my friend nudged me and said, see, I told you the church just wants your money. Loved all of it except for that. So let me just speak to that for a second. Um, I get that. There are many churches and Christian organizations who've handled this poorly. Um, and if you think Lake Forest only wants your money, it's not really about the teaching of Jesus that to flip the table to have the healthiest life possible regarding money and really know that you are significantly investing in God's mission, which gives money to your, meaning to your money and purpose to your paycheck. If you don't believe that, if it's really just the church wants your money, then don't give here. <laughs> But give somewhere to take a step to trust Jesus and live a flipped script life with money. Call your own bluff, especially if you're a Christian who's kind of given up on this kind of thing. Call your own bluff. Go home tonight. Go on the website of the Charlotte Rescue Mission. They're amazing what God does through them. And, and start giving proportionally 1% to 3% or up to 10% and see what God does in your life and write me a note about it. That would be great. Why, 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 why? This brings us to number four. The conventional script and Jesus script with money. Perhaps of all Jesus' teaching on money, of everything he says in the Gospels, the most striking and prophetic, back to him being a prophet, prophetically clear teaching comes from Matthew 6. And this is uh, replace mammon with worship. Matthew 6, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. You're going to either hate one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. But the word he uses in his language is mammon, which was a word that meant money as a false god or idol, a little g god, as the most important thing in our life. You see, Jesus sees money as the number one competitor for our worship. That's why he said that. It's the number one competitor for our worship. And so in the end, this is about worship. More than anything else in our culture, money has the ability to get a grip on our hearts and become a kind of master. And that's what's so fascinating about the upside-down nature of God's kingdom here. And get this, on the, this is, relates to all four of these principles. We don't so much give to a need. That's not the point of these four principles, as we have a need to give. Through living a generous life and tithing back to God as an act of worship at the root of our lifeblood that comes from our life's work and whatever we have inherited. Because giving is the one thing, Jesus says, that frees us from the idolatry of money, which is the primary idolatry in our culture, I don't think there's many people who would dispute that. Giving is the number one way to release the grip of that idolatry and to know that we live a life of true worship and peace. And if I can return to our original prophetic performance art of Jesus of flipping tables, this is part of what's happening when Jesus flipped the tables in the temple. The greed had gotten in the way of worship in the temple at that day. And out of the preoccupation with money, it was edging out room in the temple itself, in the court of the Gentiles, for people who were looking for faith. They couldn't get past the money changers. And what if, that, what if a preoccupation with money might be doing the same for you, edging out 
the priority and the primacy of God's mission in your life. And so that's why I ask, how about you? Where, where do you want God's help in flipping the table of money in your life? Uh, would you just talk to the Holy Spirit during our time of preparation for communion and taking it? What, what of these words, I've given you eight words actually, not four. Which ones strike you to say, Jesus, would you help me to not have this as my belief or my attitude or my behavior? And would you please help me out of your power, not mine, to put a life of generosity on? Uh, we have a large table out in the lobby with markers on it. Love for you to interact with that all three weeks of this series. And so if any of these eight words, owner or steward, more or enough or contentment, <clears throat> uh, giving, receiving or giving, mammon or worship, any of those four words, you just, just give a little evidence, some of you on your way out, uh, uh, that the Holy Spirit's just just tapping at you to pray about this and to act on it. But I write one of those words or a half a sentence or a phrase or a bullet point as your prayer that will stay here through the week and represent your allowing Jesus to write the script for your life regarding money and not the culture. Well, let me pray as we move toward communion. Oh, Jesus, we love you. And we thank you, Jesus, thank you that you flipping tables in the temple ultimately was you wanted to make room for one more hurting person to come to your house with your people and discover a relationship with you through prayer. And then you lived it out by welcoming the, blame, the, the lame and the blind in that moment. Jesus, thank you for Lake Forest, Huntersville folks. Help us to be a tribe of people who removes obstacles and sets a welcoming, generous heart so that one more person who's given up on church but not on God or needs healing of any manner in their life will not get crowded out by our busyness or our churchy way of doing things, but instead would would see you lifted up in our midst, Jesus, and would meet you in your healing power for their life. We need you as well, Jesus, and that's why we're ready to come to your table. We are the lame. We are the blind. Heal us. Open our eyes again as we rehearse your sacrifice for us at the table. In Jesus' name, amen.